So it's a real pleasure to be here today to talk to you about some thoughts I've had. Thoughts about innovation and complexity. I'm a physicist. I work in a hospital. And I've built many machines that actually treat patients that have cancer over the years. And as we do this, we're thinking about the challenge as we move forward to bring more and more complex systems forward for us to treat patients that have cancer. And complexity is something that is very interesting to contemplate when you want to innovate. Because we said, well, we did this, now we can do this. And people look at you and they say, I mean, it's going to become too complicated. It's too hard to integrate all this information, all these pieces together. It's overwhelming. And I started to think about that. How can we contemplate an approach where complexity is not a barrier? Maybe complexity could be something that stimulates us to do something. So my talk today is about burying the complexity. I realize that there's an opportunity to take some of this complexity and bury it. And this is an extremely powerful concept. And it actually focuses in my talk on what I call nonlinear events in man's affair with technology. I'm a physicist. I couldn't resist using the word nonlinear, and so I decided to use it in my title. Okay, so just to kind of get you thinking about complexity, I've produced for you two pictures, two very simple pictures. The one on the, on the left is a, a device created by a guy named Rob Higgs. He's a 36-year-old British uh, kind of genius guy. And the one on the right, I don't know who invented this, except someone who's frustrated with getting the cork out of the wine bottle. And these two devices do the exact same thing. The one on the left, by turning the crank, advances the device and spins the screw into the cork, pulls it out, lifts the bottle up, and fills the wine glass. It's a very interesting. You should watch this video on, 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 on YouTube. The one on the right, incredibly simple. They both do the same job. Complexity. The one on the left, complex. The one on the right, simple. I'm going to just clear the air a little bit with some definitions, and there's not many text slides in this talk, but just a few. Complexity is described by a lot of people. There's actually scientists and mathematicians who focus on the concepts of complexity. And if you just go to a wiki and, and you pull up some titles, in lay terms, we can characterize something complex that is something with many parts and intricate arrangement. In science, as the study of the phenomena which emerges from a collection of interacting objects, too many objects interacting in ways, and there we can't predict what's going to come up. That's a complexity in science. And the third one in business, where complexity management seeks to try to remove the complexity from different systems. And all I'm going to talk about today is complexity in the, in the lay definition, characterizing something with many parts in intricate arrangement. Now, complexity usually carries with it some perception, the perception of burden. I'm sure as you got through your further and further in your classes in, in mathematics, this is getting really complex. Complex is too much complexity. It, 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 it describes a burden, a labor. And this was the reaction I got when I said, well, we could treat this patient. We did this, 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 this. And the clinicians are like, oh, this is getting too complex. There's a natural pushback as complexity grows. Yet we continue to move forward. Albert Einstein, a favorite physicist of mine, had a great quote. Things should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. What do you mean by that? If we want to achieve our objectives, we can't make it so simple that we don't. We have to bring the complexity up to the point that achieves our objectives. And I'll just introduce this a little later on because it's really key. It actually is a challenge for us to contemplate uh, complexity and how we deal with it. So I started thinking about these ideas, just um, you know, casually you know, dreaming to myself about how am I going to deal with the fact that I think we can go further with cancer therapeutics. I think we could be much more aggressive. We could bring more information to the situation. We could, we could have really powerful machines. But how can we overcome the complexity resistance? We just can't. We're, we're too clumsy to do these things. So I thought to myself, well, let's just make a simple graph. Because the physicist always likes to draw on a napkin with a pen and, and, then, and sketch things out to try to build a model in their mind. And that's what I started to do. And I thought, OK, well. Let's just go with the idea. As we add more things, things get more complex. So this is a simple graph. Complexity, things. Add more things, things get more complex. 
Now, if that's true, I mean, it could, be, it could be worse than this. It could be as we add more things, the complexity scales exponentially. And in fact, that's what the science definition would suggest, is the interaction between the systems become impossible to predict and manage. Or, I mean, maybe if you're an optimist, you could say, well, as we add more and more things, it doesn't get more complex. It just kind of gets to a threshold of maximum complexity. And that would be suggesting that some things that you added, pardon me, some things that you added didn't really add that much to the system. But all the time, complexity is climbing as we add things. There's so many things we can do in the world. If we accept this as a matter of fact, we are not going to do all the things we could do. It's a fundamental limit for our ability to innovate, to integrate, to capitalize on information, to drive new systems. This is like a doomsday picture that we will always increase complexity. Let me give you a couple of examples which kind of got me thinking about this. Really interesting examples from history. Very powerful. Three extremely powerful examples from history. This guy is James Watt. James Watt is recognized as the inventor of the steam engine. And the steam engine, I'm sure many of you understand, uses the laws of thermodynamics, although he didn't really understand that at the time, uses the laws of thermodynamics to fill a piston as air, uh, steam expanded, drive an arm, could rotate this, and a rotating thing back in the Industrial Revolution was a very valuable tool. You could pump things with it, you could sew, run sewing machines and, and weaving devices, extremely powerful. Now he realized this was a possibility. This device he had created through his ingenious mechanical mind that we could produce these things. But if you look in these pictures, you also see a little device. I mean, many of you have probably seen this little device on these pictures and thought, oh, that's curious. No one ever talks about that thing. This is always there. What is that thing? And that thing is really important. His innovation that he brought forward in the steam engine was, in fact, going to be too complex. It was going to be too complex to work. And in 1788, James Watt developed a mechanical device called the flyball governor. In the first paragraph there, describes Mr. Watt believed that throttling a steam valve by a human being was not the best way to maintain a constant speed of the steam engine. Think about this. A steam engine, a thermo thermodynamic system, bolted onto something that has wheels and going down a train track in different temperature, the wind changes. The thermodynamic system is very complicated. So what did he do? Not only did he innovate to make the steam engine, he innovated twice, and he innovated twice to create the automatic control system known as the flyball governor. So by innovating twice, what did he do? He buried the complexity of that device. You don't even see the complexity. Innovate twice and bury the complexity. Here's another guy who's had a profound impact on our lives today, Tim Berners-Lee. Tim Berners-Lee was at CERN. And he had been working there for a number of years, and he made a simple proposal. Actually, I was there a little while ago. I saw the original proposal behind a little glass box. It's pretty basic. I mean, you can download it and read it. In fact, if you do, you will see this very simple little graph that shows a whole bunch of things moving around. And he brought this proposal forward for a very simple reason. He said, at CERN, there's a problem. There's a lot of turnover of people. All the technical details of past projects, which are so valuable, are sometimes lost forever. They can only be recovered after you do some kind of detective activity. The information is recorded, but just can't be found. So we had this situation where the environment they produced, very productive, very exciting, rich amounts of information coming up, and then the loss. It was too complex. So what did he do? He simply described a system, described a system that would allow us to manage that, this growing complexity. And today, we see that as a World Wide Web. Is the World Wide Web complicated? It's beautifully simple. I'll give you a third example. This guy, this guy knew how to bury complexity. I would ask you in the audience, is this device not the most beautifully simple interface ever created? If you think it's a simple interface, put up your hand. How many of you know absolutely that this is one of the most complex pieces of technology man has ever made? 
Isn't that an interesting paradox? This guy took an amazing complexity and buried it. Human ingenuity and our ability to manipulate complexity. This is a very powerful space. Humans are ingenious at assembling things. In general, the more things we add to the system, the greater the complexity. However, the relationship between the addition of things to the system and its complexity is not obvious. James Watt innovated twice and made something that was too complex to handle, handleable. Tim Berners-Lee saw an amazing complex system and suddenly we see it a very simple way of sharing tools. Steve Jobs took a very complicated, growing opportunity in computing science interaction and reduced it to something that four-year-olds can play with. Amazing. So I want to introduce the concept of apparent complexity. The apparent complexity concept deals with the fact that there's an inconsistency between what we know is complex and how we perceive it. So I'm going to go back to my graph, complexity and things. And if you believed that complexity always gets greater when you add things, you would have a line like this, and you would be doomed to integrating this many things and many opportunities of technology into anything we could ever actually use. I think there's something else, the concept of apparent complexity. And apparent complexity looks like this. As we add things, suddenly we get contractions in complexity. Some innovators, true innovators, are able to contract the complexity. The apparent complexity has dropped. Now this curve, I, I don't have any data for this curve, but it's a concept that Ted's all about. This curve can be really thought about. What is this? What happened right here? Why did that happen right there? What, what's happening here? So I'm going to go back to Einstein. Einstein, is, and, and I'm going to plot things against apparent complexity here just to make things easier. Maybe we could think about a yellow line, a threshold, a limit, a limit on our ability as humans to manage and accommodate complexity. Maybe that yellow line has something to do with what Einstein suggested. Things she made as simple as possible, but not simpler. We have a situation where as we add things, complexity climbs, but it becomes unbearable. We see the potential of crossing this yellow line, but we realize we'll exceed the complexity we can tolerate. And true innovators allow us to drop and continue in innovation and integration. Does Einstein suggest that we should be as close to this line as possible? Because that's where innovations will come from? Could we possibly predict, pardon me, could we possibly predict when these events are going to happen? You could also ask yourself, after a big shift like this in apparent complexity, is this real innovation happening here? If you had the iPad, are apps really innovative? The innovation was the iPad. This is just adding stuff after the fact. Was the Industrial Revolution not enabled by the steam engine? Were all the other elements just adding stuff? Was the drop in complexity associated with the World Wide Web the real innovation? And us just connecting stuff? Expanding because of the drop in apparent complexity? Just the natural things that humans do and innovate? So apparent complexity, I think, is really closely linked to innovation. How can we cross the yellow line without crossing the yellow line? How can we bring more in without exceeding our ability to accommodate the complexity? Does keeping it simple, as Einstein suggested, require us to innovate? Is there a zone just below the yellow line where things get so complex that somehow innovation hatches something else that lets us go back and continue to add things to these systems? Was Einstein, in fact, telling us how to innovate? Does escalating complexity predict for innovation? 
Now you might wonder why would a physicist that works in healthcare care about this? The reality is, is healthcare, as you can imagine, is one of the most complex systems we have in society. I personally, and I know the inside of healthcare, find healthcare incredibly complex. It's opaque with its complexity. And I'm sure many of you find healthcare similarly complex. In fact, there's an article from back in 1996 from Crossing the Quality Chasm, an interesting book if you're interested in reading. But in 1996, they said healthcare today is characterized by more to know, more to manage, more to watch, more to do, and more people involved in doing it any time before. And they went on to say that our current methods of organizing and delivering care are unable to meet the expectations. Furthermore, the technologies that continue to pour out of the innovation space, they've advanced more rapidly than our ability to deliver them safely, effectively, and efficiently. We are, we are at the yellow line. We are crossing the yellow line with healthcare. And it's going to get even crazier. There's a great physician, a uh, Canadian physician, worked at Hopkins for many years. His name's William Oster. I'm sure you've heard of the Oster Hospital here in Toronto. William Oster is a fantastic, well-recognized individual. And he was really insightful. And he, uh, he has this great quote. And he said, it's not for the great variability among individuals. Medicine might as well be a science, not an art. Now this thinking basically means, I don't know how this patient's going to respond, so I've got to manage this as an art, not as a strict science and engineering activity. But as you'll hear and maybe in th maybe further talks today or in your interaction with many scientists in the field of medicine, there's an emerging exciting opportunity in healthcare. It's called personalized cancer medicine. And personalized cancer medicine really is about bringing new information that eliminates or explains the variability among individual patients. New information, new pieces of information into an already extremely complex system. And in terms of personalized cancer medicine, the general thinking is that we're going to have the right care for the right patient at the right time. That sounds really complicated. Doesn't that sound complicated? We're not just going to get it right on average. We're going to get it right for the individual. And you talk about this idea and you realize, on my complexity curve, we're crossing the yellow bar here. This is not a positive thing. It's not a positive thing because we think We'll have the information, but we're too clumsy to execute. Just a complicated figure to drive home the point. Patients will look at the tissue from the patients and the images of the patient. This information goes up and will design and select sub-individual patients who will be treated in specific ways. Even during the course of their treatment now, we will be collecting information from the patients to tune and interact in a dynamic fashion between how they're responding and the therapies we apply. Now, if that isn't complex, I don't know what is. We're going to see a huge increase in the number of things in healthcare. But don't worry, I'm optimistic. Because what I know and what I've told you today is that when you get close to the yellow line, you almost cross the yellow line, things contract. Healthcare is on the verge of experiencing a contraction in apparent complexity. I hope my comments today, the past history of innovation of humans to remove complexity, would give you optimism that in fact the potential for deploying personalized cancer medicine is a real opportunity. Thank you for your attention.